Prior to entering academia, Dr. Gray Etherton was a counselor for adolescents with neurodevelopmental conditions. She's interested in understanding how people with autism see the social world and exploring individual differences in social processing. Her other research interest lies more broadly in embodied social processing. Currently, she is an assistant professor at the University of Plymouth in the UK. These webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.org. And now I will turn this over to our speaker. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me, Denise. I'm going to be talking to you today about autism and gender. Thanks. So our agenda is, I'm gonna talk briefly, give an overview, of gender development. I'm going to talk more specifically about the intersection between gender and autism with a focus on sort of female autism presentation. I'm then going to talk about three research studies that I've conducted, two of which are published and one of which is in prep. So a bit of a sneak peek with that one. Um, the first one I've talked about a bit in before and some webinars here, but it was a scoping project looking at autism, gender, and aging. I'm going to talk about an experiment I did that I haven't talked about before on autism and implicit gender associations in the general population. And then I'm going to talk about a new qualitative project that I'm just going to be submitting in the next few weeks that's about pictorial representations of autism and autism in the kind of cultural zeitgeist. And then I'm going to talk about some future directions and what are some possible new avenues of research to explore autism and gender. So I like to start talks and presentations and even my papers with quotes. And I got on the internet to find some quotes that had to do with things like our construction of gender or female identity construction. I thought I'd find something from some feminist scholars, but I kept coming across quotes that I was pretty familiar with in the past. And it sort of made me think a bit about our constructions of gender, particularly female gender, which I guess is my own lived experiment experience, and how really being a female is such a kind of process of social learning and trying to fit into specific molds. So some of you might already be familiar with some of these quotes. A girl should be two things, classy and fabulous. A lady's imagination is very rapid. It jumps from admiration to love, from love to matrimony in a moment. When a man gives his opinion, he's a man. When a woman gives her opinion, she's a bitch. I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world, a beautiful little fool. So um, I present these quotes in these pictures uh, to kind of jump, jump start the talk in what we're going to be discussing and focusing on quite a bit uh, in the next hour or so is the construction of gender and what it might feel like to be a neurodiverse woman and to exist in a world where you are taught that there are specific rules that you have to follow and things that you have to know in order to fulfill your gender expectations, and that there are certain things that you need to avoid in order to not fall into those kind of um, sort of negative non-gender conforming behaviors. Um, and this is something that we are increasingly starting to understand is a challenge, particularly for people who are neurodiverse. There are all kinds of rules that are embedded within these quotes that we are expected to follow um, with regards to our gender and our gender performance. And this might be something that maybe uh, are leading to challenges, particularly for women who are neurodiverse. So we're going to talk about some research that kind of explores that and explores gender identity, including some of my work. So we learn about gender from a very early age. Uh, as soon as children begin speaking around 18 to 24 months, they use gender labels regularly. They use them about themselves and they use them about people around them. It's a way that they explore the world by understanding how they're supposed to categorize things with relation to gender. And we continue to see that children form kind of categories of gender um, and that those categories and that pattern of the way that they understand gender don't really change a lot throughout their early development. Beginning in preschool and extending all the way to fourth grade, 
children consistently say that genders can be split in specific ways. For instance, girls are nice. They wear dresses. They like dolls. Boys, on the other hand, have short hair. They play active games and they are rough. We also know that children report different patterns of aggression and they show different um, sort of behavioral patterns within peer groups starting from a very early age. By the age of four, both males and females report that females show more relational aggression. They talk about people behind their back, they gossip, they exclude. These are all kind of forms of indirect bullying, whereas males show more physical aggression or overt forms of bullying, for instance. So what we see from a very early age is that females show sort of kind of sophisticated social patterns where they are using things like reputation management and social hierarchies to kind of control their peer relationships and to also send messages to females and males. Uh, very kind of different social patterns that we can observe from a very early age, and these things continue to develop throughout the lifespan. Um, so how, what does this have to do with autism? How can we sort of um, extend these gender patterns into understanding how autism might differentially affect males and females and what it might mean for an autistic female? So autism and gender has been a really uh, commonly studied topic for a long time. Um, one of the reasons is that autism is seen as a condition that disproportionately affects males. The current estimate is for every four males with autism, there's only one female with autism. So quite um, a high male to female ratio. That's actually the lowest that it's ever been. If we go back uh, in early autism research history, we find very, very skewed, even more skewed ratios than that. This is, for instance, a quote from Hans Asperger, one of the sort of earliest and most famous autism researchers from the 1940s. He writes, it is fascinating to note that the autistic children we have seen are almost exclusively boys. The reason, he explains, is the difference between male and female intelligence. In general, girls are the better learners. The question there is sort of what is it that they're learning that means that they would not have autism? And kind of to trail into that, what is it that would separate, therefore, a female from a male is this theory that's called the female protective effect. This was a theory that was conceived as sort of a response to why is it that there um, are more males than females that are diagnosed with autism? And these researchers came up with the idea that autism is a cluster of risk factors. And females, by their very nature, by the things that they're exposed to in their environment, are less likely to develop autism because the type of tasks that they're exposed to in their early development, the type of stimuli that they're given, toys, games, dress-up clothes, that all of those things sort of keep them from developing autism. Take, for instance, that females are given toys like dolls, and they're using dolls to imitate behavior that they see from their mothers, rocking a doll, feeding a doll. They are also told to engage and pretend to play with that doll, and they're also showing empathy towards that doll. All three of those behaviors would be behaviors that traditionally would be at odds with autism, pretend play, imaginative play, modeling, and empathy. And so in that sense, females from a very early age are protected from developing autism, is what this theory is, whereas males are encouraged in areas that would almost kind of elicit autistic behaviors. And so therefore, in order for a female to get diagnosed with autism, according to this theory, they would have to have loads and loads of risk factors, much higher threshold of traits and almost kind of going against all of the stimuli that they're getting in their environment that's conditioning them to be the opposite of autism. That makes sense. So this is one of the famous theories that people use to understand autism and gender and its intersection. Another very famous theory and from probably the most famous autism researcher, Simon Baron-Cohen, is the male brain theory. So in this theory, 
the idea is that there's kind of two types of people, if you will, almost kind of the old fashioned left brain, right brain theory. And in Baron Cohen's model, it's empathizing at one end and systemizing on the other. And these things are diametrically opposed. And people fall somewhere in the middle of the spectrum or they're at the extremes of these parts of the spectrum. And kind of more generally, Baron Cohen asserts that women are empathizers, males, uh, men are systemizers, almost that kind of men are from Mars, women are from Venus. The people that are systemizers like logic, they like rules, they're more likely to be involved in a STEM field, whereas women um, or empathizers are people that would be more likely to be in the helping profession. They're more creative, they rely less on logic and more on emotion, and they um, sort of express themselves throughout the lifespan in these different ways. And Baron Cohen also kind of to tail on to this, systemizing and empathizing is autism. And the idea here is that autistic people are hyper systemizers, and they also therefore are extreme male brain. And he's explored this in a number of different ways. Um, he's looked at simply at the rates of people taking a self assessment of empathizing and systemizing, and finds that autistic people fall more highly on systemizing and and people with high autistic traits do as well. He also looks at things like um, fetal levels of testosterone for people that are at risk to develop autism and finds elevated rates. He even looks at things like digit span and looks at the length of the fourth finger, which is uh, longer fourth fingers indicate more testosterone. And he finds that autistic people have longer ring fingers than people who don't on average all kinds of research that has to do with sort of the biological basis of autism and how it might be related to the male biological sex. He also looks at things like transgenderism and gender diversity, and he also finds that people in this category tend to score more highly on systemizing. They also tend to report higher levels of autistic traits, and people who are gender diverse are more likely to have an autism diagnosis. But this is a, I would say this is a somewhat controversial uh, theory of autism. There's a really good critique for people that are interested in this by Cron and Fenton. Lots of critiques on this. One of them is that at its basis, it's quite a simplistic understanding of both gender and autism to simply say that um, that males are one way and women are the other, and that there's a biological basis for these types of uh, kind of personality preferences or correlates, and also saying that, therefore, we can understand autism as being a manifestation of being male. And one of the biggest sort of critiques of this, in my, my opinion, <laughs> is that we have examples of many autistic women who identify in ways that would be feminine, that would be an expression of the female gender, if you will, and also have autism. Uh, these are a collection of pictures of famous autistic women who express their gender in a number of different ways, some of which might be, I guess you could suppose, sort of uh, in line with heteronormative female gender expression. For instance, you might not be familiar, this is a picture at the top is Christine McGuinness. She's quite famous in the UK. She's a pageant queen. She's a member of the Real Housewives of Cheshire. Uh, she found out she was autistic after she had several autistic children. She presents in what we would consider a very feminine way. She's on the Real Housewives. She has a large peer group, friendship group, and also autistic. So some of these kind of more simplistic accounts of being more male and therefore more autistic don't seem to necessarily relate to many of the women that I also identify as, autism, as autistic. And these theories also miss that many of the women that are missed for autism diagnoses are missed because the way that they behave is in line with their female gender and therefore is seen as social and not autistic. So for instance, from holiday 2015, 
A young woman with autism noted that carrying several well-worn books everywhere she goes and constantly reading them to the detriment of all other social interactions may be a repetitive behavior that goes undetected. So we're very quick to perhaps be um, a boy playing with Legos and lining up his cars and saying that not a very social interest. And it seems quite restricted and quite obsessive and quite repetitive. That looks like autism. But we see a little girl lining up dolls, playing with dolls one by one, having a special place where her horse figurines go, keeping her room really tidy and almost kind of obsessively organized. We still think, oh, she has dolls. Dolls are a social toy. That can't be autism. So there's some biases and preconceptions there that mean that female expressions of autism couldn't possibly be autism. And then we come to another issue that's possibly um, keeping female autistic women from being diagnosed in a timely way or being recognized as autistic. And this is masking or camouflaging. So this is a study by Tierney uh, in 2016 that interviewed autistic adolescent females specifically on their experiences of camouflaging or masking. They say, I see how other people act first then copy them in my own way. I change it a little bit so it's not like I'm really copying. I would try and copy them, but not look like I was exactly copying them. So if they were playing a game and they moved and they did something, then I would try and copy it, but not exactly like them. So what we're seeing here is that autistic females are recognizing in the same way I think all females recognize that there there's a lot of social rules when you're a female. Um, I know there are for males as well, but we do have evidence that the social hierarchies and the way that we kind of these nuanced, very subtle social cues um, that women are supposed to pick up on. And it's very important that we don't miss those cues because it can lead to rejection from our peers. And this is heightened for females. And so autistic women are not oblivious to these things. They like to fit in have friendship groups as much as anyone else. And so they mask and they camouflage and they use these types of tricks that will to copying, mimicking, to blend in, to fit in. And by doing that, they will be missed more than males. And again, this is a this is in many ways kind of what all women sometimes have to do in a sense. And it might be heightened for autistic females, but it means that they will not be detected because they're doing such a good job in a sense of putting on this mask. So I'm gonna now get to some of my research. Hopefully this was a good background on some of the topics we're going to be discussing. And I was interested in understanding kind of more generally things about what are there gender differences in adult experiences of autism? particularly in relation to quality of life. How does age of diagnosis um, play a part? And I was also interested in talking to autistic people, particularly people who are diagnosed late in life and understanding what their experiences were. So in this study that's been published in Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, I surveyed 420 adults, half male, half female, half autistic and half non-autistic gave them kind of a battery of tests that all loosely relate to what we would consider to be quality of life, so things that have to do with mental health and well-being. And I also gave them a test of autistic traits, known as the, the one that I used as the autism quotient or quotient. That's a UK way of saying quotient. And uh, to, to also look at sort of um, how... Um, how high are autistic trait levels in people who either don't have autism or do, and also looking at gender differences. So I found some pretty interesting things with regards to gender. One of the things that I found is that women are significantly more likely to be diagnosed as adults than men. So autism is a condition that is present beginning at the age of two or at least we're able to detect it reliably beginning at the age of two. And in order to have autism, you need to have, you need to say that you have it since the beginning of your development because it's present since birth. 
And so therefore, it's not that these women sort of developed autism later in life. What it, what we're seeing here is that they were missed. And they were only able to receive their diagnosis and therefore receive support after they finished school, which, of course, means that all of those built-in supports that children are able to access all the way throughout school were missed for most of those, most of these women. Whereas males were able to receive early detection and they were able to therefore receive those supports. So a really big deal. And then the other thing that sort of was interesting is, all right, so so women were missed for this diagnosis, but is that because they, they weren't presenting with autism in the same way as males? Why were they missed? Is there this kind of female protective factor where women with autism are, are you know, not quite as autistic, if you will? And what we found was the opposite. Women um, are actually reporting higher um higher threshold of autistic traits, yet they were still missed for an early diagnosis, despite the fact that when they take a self-report measure, they say, yeah, I have autistic traits, a lot of them. I'm ticking all of these boxes. So in my study, I found that that's, that's significant in, when it comes to quality of life, when it comes to well-being and mental health. People who are diagnosed later in life I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if we look at this very bottom um, graph, F, we see that people who are diagnosed uh, later in life, so the later that your diagnosis takes place in terms of years, uh, the lower your quality of life score. So not having an early diagnosis, not receiving early and timely intervention was detrimental to people's well-being. So very important with you. Uh, I then interviewed autistic adults who had a late diagnosis to understand some of the effects of this late diagnosis and also to understand why do they think they were missed? Why was this diagnosis so late? Um, what were the experiences of getting a diagnosis as an adult? Um, so it was a semi-structured interview and I analyzed it using interpretive phenomenological analysis or IPA, which is a type of analysis where we, rather than the researcher kind of coming up with latent themes or trying to interpret sort of based on past research, what a, what kind of underlying meaning is in these uh, interviews, it's using participants' own words and trying to theme things in a way that is most um, in line with what they meant to say. It's really a good um, method for people with disabilities who we shouldn't really take what they say out of context or interject our own meaning as a academic. So these are all of the themes and sub themes I found from these interviews. But the one that I'm going to focus on here was that we found that one of the big barriers of a diagnosis, which almost every woman or all of the women that I interviewed discussed, is that they felt that their gender kept them from getting that diagnosis. It's simply the fact that they were a woman uh, or they were female meant that they were overlooked. This participant said, if I was a boy, I think I would have been diagnosed at 13 years old. But girls are often overlooked because they are generally quiet or they come across as shy. I'm starting to wonder how nobody noticed. My assumption is that they just put it down to being a girl. That's all I can think. Many of the women that I interviewed received diagnoses later in life because their children were diagnosed with autism. They subsequently recognized that they also had very similar symptoms. They had a high level of autistic traits. And looking back on their childhoods, they realized that their childhoods were actually not very different from their children's. It was simply that they, at that time period, when they were children, people didn't recognize that they could be autistic because they had, for instance, academic and social success or because their parents thought if they received a diagnosis, it would hold them back in life, they would always be labeled. And this might have been particularly difficult for girls because in autism, that, um, being a girl and being autistic might have even more um, connotations. So the thing that I was really interested in from after I finished this study is understanding what are the reasons why girls are being missed for an autism diagnosis? 
we know from study one that females are being missed more than males. They're getting a diagnosis, the majority, two thirds after they're 18, is really quite late. It means that there's absolutely no chance of any type of built in school intervention, which can be huge. And it's not explained by the fact that they have lower autistic traits that are protected because of their gender. They were less likely to develop a severe or extreme um, autism presentation. In our sample, women were the ones that had an even higher um, EQ score. And so and this did have an effect on quality of life. And in my qualitative study, females also said, look, gender made a big difference here. I think because I was a girl, people just didn't associate the fact that I was having these issues with it possibly being autism. So what are the effects of having a missed diagnosis? Why does this matter? Why should we care about this issue so much? Well, this is an excellent study that came out recently by Rodegaard. They had a really big sample. They used the uh, Danish statistics kind of compendium, which gave them access to 16,000 individuals with an autism diagnosis and 671,000 people without an autism diagnosis just born in the years of 1993 to 2002. And they were interested in understanding comorbidities, which is another word for saying that someone has two diagnoses. They have two mental health conditions. Particularly, they were interested in autism and the things that tend to co-occur with it. And we know there's a lot of heterogeneity or differences between people on the spectrum. And what one of the ways that we see that is through comorbidities. So for instance, depending on the sample, we can see that anxiety co-occurs with autism at as little as 2% or as high as 48% of the autism population. Those are really big ranges. And so this uh, study was interested in saying, how can we more, is there a factor that can help explain why some samples would be as low as 2% and some as high as 48? Is there some kind of hidden uh, reason within the data? And what they found is that gender plays a big role in explaining some of these discrepancies. They found that autistic females are two times more likely to have a comorbidity than autistic males. And people with a later diagnosis especially are more likely to have a comorbidity. So this is doubled in females. 26% of late diagnosed autistic females have autism and something else, whereas only 13% of autistic males diagnosed later in life have autism and something else. And that's compared to 3% of the general population having not autism, but just some other condition. And so this kind of lead, led researchers to think, well, why is it that people later in life would be more likely to have autism and something else? And there's kind of two explanations or possibilities. One of them is that if you are late in life diagnosed with autism, you've gone through lots of other diagnoses to lead up to finally being diagnosed with autism. So first, maybe the Psychiatrists will say that you have depression or you have anxiety or you have sleep issues or an eating disorder. And finally, someone along the road will say, hold on, all of these things together, maybe the underlying kind of condition that can help explain all of these different symptoms is autism. And so in that sense, people, if we don't diagnose autism first, people are going through this arduous journey, getting all of these other diagnoses without finding the root cause. And then the other kind of effect of having a late diagnosis is that by having a misdiagnosis, by not getting an early diagnosis and an early intervention, you might actually be more likely to develop things like anxiety or depression or sleep issues or eating disorders because you haven't been able to explain yourself to understand why it is that you experience life in a way that is different than neurotypical people or the general population. And it leads to a lot of stress, anxiety, and a develop um, comorbidities, which is a huge issue um, in this population. So it's really important that we continue to try and understand why is it 
that we are missing autistic females and how can we rectify that? And so one of the possibilities for why we are missing females is that possibly there's, there's without, um, at its very basis, there is a bias. That means that we are not recognizing that female who is displaying autistic behaviors and traits is autistic in the same, with the same ease uh, that we are recognizing that in autistic males. So Burroughs did a study that and he's one of, or this group is one of uh, several studies that are coming out in the next, um, in the last few years that are finding kind of how can we, is there a way that we ever cannot find a higher ratio of males to females? So sometimes in psychological research, we like to break things. If someone tells us that this is the way things are, we try and design studies where we break that and we show that that's not true. And the way that Burroughs group sort of broke the higher male to female ratio, um, except, accepted kind of statistic is that they said, why don't we look at really, really young children? And why don't we do it a lot? See whether that shows reliably that actually there's an equal ratio, but it might present differently. So what we're able, so autism is able to be reliably diagnosed beginning at around the age of two. That's when we're able to do the ADOS, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. And it's when children sort of have enough motor control, enough communicative skills to engage with a with the um, researcher or the uh, sorry um, the clinician in a way that allows us to observe autistic behaviors. But we're actually able to study autism a lot earlier if we look at siblings of autistic children. We are we know that they would be significantly more likely to go on to receive a diagnosis of autism. And so therefore, if we get a big enough group, we're able to start observing children that will be diagnosed with autism from very, very early age. And so that's exactly what these researchers did. They did a direct assessment of autistic symptoms in children, um, in infant siblings of autistic children beginning at six months. And then longitudinally, they looked at them different milestones until they were, uh, let me do my math quickly, around five and a half. So they did a total observations of 12,000. 12, and they were interested in seeing whether or not when they kind of had this group that they knew would be more likely to receive an autism diagnosis, whether they did whether they were also able to diagnose autism as reliably in females as males. And what they found is that when they look at this group from a very early age that they knew were more likely, those gender ratios disappear. And they actually found one-to-one -one male to female. And what they found though, is that there were milder symptoms in the females, but they were still present and they were reliably present. Interestingly, unconnected to the study, there was a clinician that was working with all of the children or a series of clinicians. And the researchers compared sort of their findings with the notes from the clinician. And they found that for females, the clinician notes often reference things like, we'll be monitoring the girls over time, but the girls do not need a diagnosis in the same way that the boys did. So what this study suggests is that there probably, there might not be biological sex differences in the rates of diagnosis of males and females. But there is some type of implicit bias. There is some type of milder symptoms, possibly maybe as a kind of artifact of the type of socialization that females are exposed to quite early in life. And this also affects whether or not they receive a diagnosis. Even though medical professionals will say, yes, I see that there's some autistic traits here, autistic behaviors, they're much more reticent to actually give that diagnosis to a female as opposed to a male child who's maybe exhibiting a lot more behaviors or um, at a higher kind of uh, salience, if you will. But they, and so therefore, they kind of meet that threshold and they get that diagnosis with girls' don't.
So I was interested, so this is, oh, I showed this at the beginning as well. This is from a Korean artist, these pictures who asked uh, male children and female children to bring into the room everything they owned that was either pink or everything that was blue. Kind of, kind of a shocking image of how uh, kind of gendered we are in early, these kind of formative years in early childhood where we're thinking a lot about gender and using a lot of gender labels and categories. I always like including these pictures. Uh, so this is a study I did uh, that's now been published in Plus One, Autism, Thy Name is Man. And it's a study looking at the general population and it asks the question, are there implicit biases against female autism? So what I did is I used the implicit association task, which is a some of you might be familiar with it. It's really interesting. Uh, Harvard has collected thousands upon thousands of uh, participants taking all types of different IUT tests with different stimuli pairings. You can try some if you'd like at this link. But essentially, it was a um, it's a task that was developed in the 1980s, and it asks people to pair stimuli in a number of trials, and it switches those pairings um, in each subsequent trial, and it uses keyboard presses. So for instance, on the screen here, this is a classic, one of the earliest IATs, which was looking at racial prejudice. It asked people to uh, categorize a face that they see as either being on the left-hand side of the screen, which is white people good, or on the right-hand screen, which is black people bad. So on this picture of a face, it's a black face. And so we would want to hit the button uh, on the right, which is the pairing black people bad. And the idea here is that we will be much faster and make less mistakes to pair um, stimuli in a category that's salient to us, that makes sense to us. So for instance, if we had an implicit bias towards white people over black people, we would be much faster at pressing um, buttons that are paired um, of black people and bad when we see a black face and white people and good when we see a white face. And we get more confused and make more mistakes when it's switched around. And so on an IET, it'll switch it around a number of times and we'll get a D score that kind of combines mistakes and speed. And I did an IET, uh, me and my colleagues, which paired male and female names with autistic and non-autistic traits. So I wanted to see whether or not people were more likely to press the right buttons and do so quickly when they saw autistic names, autistic words, and male names versus non-autistic words and female names and vice versa. I'll show you what those stimuli are in a minute. And I also wanted to, so that's what a measure of implicit bias and the way we can understand implicit bias is that it's not explicit. We might never act upon, you know, some of these biases that we're in a way that we're conscious of. But nonetheless, being implicitly biased might affect the way that we see information, the way we respond to information without even thinking about it. So it, it does have some explanatory power for our behavior, even if we're not aware of those biases. And I also was interested in understanding about kind of explicit bias, if you will, or the way that people explicitly think about autism and gender. So I presented people with vignettes that described an autistic person, and that was taken from previous research. Um, half of people and half males, half females got a vignette that had a male name, Matthew. Half the other half got uh, the same vignette. Everything's identical except it's a female name, Harry. People were asked to score the AQ, that self-report of autistic traits, uh, for that person. So essentially assess them on how, how autistic they are. Uh, um, particularly interested in sort of item by item differences. So these are the male and female names. And these are the autistic and non-autistic words. And these are taken from previous research that's also used in IAT on autism. Okay. And then this is the vignette, also something that's been studied in previous research. Matthew Carey is very reserved. He, she struggles to make new friends. He, she prefers, uh, 
All right, my words come out. To speak to people they're already familiar with and already know. They don't like it when their desk is rearranged at work and they like having a routine. At work, they have difficulty determining if their boss is happy with their performance. And they often struggle to understand their colleagues' jokes. They prefer speaking about topics they know a lot about. In their leisure time, they play individual games and sports like golf rather than playing games and teams. Okay, so self-reported autism knowledge didn't affect results. And what we did find was a significant effect on the IAT. When there were female names paired with autistic words, people were significantly slower on the IAT and they made more mistakes. As opposed to if there were male names paired with autistic words, people did a lot better. It was much easier for them to complete the task. Hmm. What we also found is that there was a difference on the vignettes, not the overall score. People did a pretty good job of giving the AQ test. They gave a pretty high score for both either Matthew or Carrie, but there were item by item differences. When the AQ is scored so that half of the items are reverse scored. So if you say that you really like doing things with others rather than on your own, that would be something that would be the opposite for a person with autism. So everything that's marked I, yes, I agree with this, would be reversed and therefore marked low because that would be not very autistic. That makes sense. What we found was that the only items that were explicitly male that were always rated higher or significantly higher for Matthew were autistic traits, whereas things that were significantly higher for Carrie were the opposite, were the things that we needed to reverse score. So essentially, people are a, the opposite of autism. It's something they would associate with Harry, whereas autism is something they would associate with Matthew. Sort of kind of distancing female gender from autism. So we did find that there is overall a bias associating females with with not being autistic. So very briefly, um, this is a study that I'm kind of, I'm just finished writing it up. It's sort of an odd one, but it's kind of cool as well. Uh, I'm interested in sort of what's the zeitgeist around autism? What is sort of the cultural climate around it? How can we understand it really broadly? And how can we do that in a way that's not interjecting our own bias? And our broader cultural consciousness is informed by short, intense sound vision bites. We have constellatory access to diverse materials. In other words, we have a lot of things at our fingertips through the internet, through the kind of language of the internet, of a lot of images and memes, like that one I picked out below, that we can use to understand how people more broadly conceive of topics like autism and allow them to explain why they picked the sort of images that they did. So that's the study that I've done in this case, in this study. I asked people, uh, 163 people, to upload a picture that represents autism, avoiding pictures with words, and to explain the reasoning behind their choice. And I coded these, my team did, um, for our themes. And one of the things that we found was that autism is a spectrum and people are recognizing in the pictures they put, in the explanations they put, that we need to reconceptualize autism with relation to gender. So I'm not going to read these because I know that we're getting close on time. But people picked images of women. Traditionally, I guess we would say in a traditional gender role, um, typically presenting female. And they wrote about the particular struggles that women face having autism. Um, so this, the woman in the image looks like this to me. She's putting on a face for others, but underneath she looks upset and stressed. She feels isolated and anxious. I'm aware that women who are ASD might present differently to men and might be learning to mask or fake because women are conditioned so much to look after others. And I think the, the image fits with this. So in summary, autistic women are receiving a diagnosis later in life compared to males. But from my research, it's not because that's product of lower autistic trait levels. Uh, we find that 
um, in the general population, people are implicitly associating autism with males more than females. They explicitly rate females as more social and therefore less autistic with regards to traits. But the cultural zeitgeist of autism and gender may be changing. People are starting to perhaps recognize the autistic, the female autistic phenotype and the particular struggles that autistic women are experiencing with regards to masking and having to fulfill certain gender roles while also having differences in development. And that's a good thing. Certainly. So I want to just say for anyone that's watching, if you're interested in participating in any future research that I'm doing, any of the topics that I'm about to talk about, my email that I use, it's kind of email for life, if you will, from my undergraduate days, gray.s.atherton at vanderbilt.edu. Please email me if you'd like to be contacted in the future for possibly participating in a project. So some of the things that I'm going to be exploring in future research is understanding the female autistic trait presentation. How is it different than autistic male presentation? And how can we recognize it? So some of the ways that we immediately kind of associate autism with gender might have to do with male presentations. How do we understand the unique way that females present? How can we start to pick out some of those behaviors and traits so that we recognize in female children and female adults, this is actually autism, not this other thing. And I'm also interested in gender diversity on the spectrum. So we find that people who are autistic are significantly more likely to experience gender fluidity and might be more uh, open to gender diverse expression. And I'm interested in how autism intersects with that. And then I'm really interested in improving adult experiences of well-being, particularly adults with autism. So how can we improve outcomes when it comes to adult milestones like parenting, employment, relationships with partners, relationships with, uh, with uh, friend groups? How do we understand healthy aging in autism? These are just some of the references. I'm going to be giving all of my slides to Denise to post as well, so people have access to these materials. Please look up some of these studies if they're interesting to you. They're really good. Tip of the iceberg for autism and gender research. And then thank you very much to my team that's made all of this research possible. And I'd like to now open up for any questions that people have. I see people have already started posting some, which is fantastic. So I'll just go through and start answering any of those. But if you have anything, please don't hesitate to go ahead and put it in the Q&A chat. Okay. So in regards to masking, is it that women have more success masking or more likely to try to engage in comparison to male counterparts? So I definitely understand the first part of your question, Lindsay. I'm trying to see are more likely to try to engage in comparison, compare, in, oh, in comparison to male counterparts. I see what you're saying. That's a really good question. So I think it's a very tough question in a sense. Um, I think that, I think that women are more likely to engage in masking, period. Whether they're more successful in engaging in masking is probably a very subjective uh, thing that we would need to probably, we would probably need to do some observational studies where we recorded women masking and asked people to rate, rate those women on their behaviors, autistic women. And there is some interesting research from people that do those types of studies. I know that the women that I speak to, that I've spoken to in, in my research, have felt, yeah, have felt that they are, they are engaging in masking a lot. I think that males I've spoken to also report this. Research suggests when there's some kind of camouflaging um, self-report measures, women tend to be higher on them, but autistic people, both male and female, are higher than neurotypical. So everyone's masking, neurotypicals included. Autistic people do it more and autistic women do it the most. But autistic women will tell you that they're terrible at masking. 
They tell you they do it a lot, but that they don't feel that they're successful in doing it. And or they'll say that maybe they're successful, but it's so hard and it's so exhausting. So I think that uh, I hope that that answered that question. Um, again, success in masking is probably going to be pretty subjective, but yeah. Okay. Why are clinicians reluctant to diagnose girls with autism despite noticing telltale characteristics? It's a great question. How can we counter this bias as parents and professionals? Well, Kira, I think that one of the reasons that they are reluctant to diagnose them is probably tied up with this idea of sort of a misdiagnosis. So we are taught about autism through a male lens. The earliest research, which really still informs kind of our DSM-5 description of autism, all the way back from Tanner, is based predominantly on male children. And so we tend to think, well, is that really autism? Because everything I've learned about autism is through this kind of male lens of uh, male behavior. And therefore, this woman this or this female child is presenting in a way that's not exactly that. So I don't really know if it's that. And then we get a lot of information like they have a lot of friends. They like to play with their dolls. Uh, they, they, they speak earlier than autistic males. And that doesn't seem right. How can they also be social yet be autistic? And so we're reluctant to give them that diagnosis because we don't want to get it wrong. I think that it's not probably in, it's, it's less to do with the stigma aspect, more that not everything feels right. And so how can we counter this bias is a really good question. Um, I think that one of the ways to probably counter it is to spend more time exploring that diagnosis. So in that study that I presented about how they were able to break the gender ratio and find equal gender rate, um, ratios between males and females is that they did a longitudinal assessment and check-ins quite often. And they found that every time they did their check-in, they still saw that same kind of autistic presentation, but it was milder. And so that gave them a lot more information rather than trying than doing that assessment once and dismissing it, even though the child was borderline or threshold. So I think it's being open to female milder presentation and kind of not dismissing the kind of paradox of a child presenting that's very social, yet also might have autism. Those two are not, not exclusive. Interest in the same question as above. Yeah, hopefully that helped. You know, BIPOC women are highly missed, highly. Absolutely, I do. Um, they're the most highly missed. So we know that in general, um, Minority groups are less likely to be diagnosed with every neurodevelopmental condition, autism included. And it's not because there's a protective factor of ethnicity or different culture. It's because they um, are, we are less um, equipped as professionals to recognize how a child that is um, of a minority group and maybe we're less uh, familiar with kind of that culture. And so we are less familiar with that child in a sense. And it's a huge, huge problem. And it's a heavily research, not as heavily as it should be researched issue. But I'm really interested in this topic as well. Um, yeah, it's compounded in this group. Absolutely. Is there research on the observed range of gender acquisition, gender identity expression in females with autism? That's a great question. Many seem to be challenged to understand the construct of gender. That's a great question and a really would be a fascinating research project. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of a study I've, I've come across that, that looks at that as gender identity or gender expression from that really early age where we know that it's starting to become um, highly salient. So typically we're thinking around the age of four. Um, but I would imagine that we would see differences. Um, we would probably see 
maybe more gender fluidity or less gender conformity. And that would be a really, really interesting study. And it probably has to do with differences in things like imitation and modeling, because a lot of the, the gender expression that we get is simply a product of using modeling. So we have a same gender parent, and we observe their behavior, we observe their appearance, and we imitate. We know that those things are delayed in autistic children, and so we would probably see less of that type of gender-specific modeling would be my hypothesis. Um, but that is only a hypothesis. That would be a really interesting thing to study if it hasn't been studied already. And they may seem challenged to understand the construct of gender. Absolutely. I think that that's very true. I think that they are. And, and if anything, it's quite refreshing in that sense. It's a group of people that maybe are not feeling as constrained to fall into specific binary gender categories, which is a, a very good thing. Mm, I'm kind of going, I don't know if I'm going in the right order, but maybe I will go with it. Well. Is, there, is there any research about a higher rate of early males diagnosed having a female sibling diagnosed later in their adult life? Um, so higher rate of early diagnosed males. Okay, so and then they have a female sibling who's diagnosed later in their adult life. Yeah. So I'm not familiar with research that's specifically looking at kind of gender splits within sibling groups, but absolutely, I, I feel very confident in saying that, yeah, there will be males that have been diagnosed early. And we know that if you have um, if you are a child with autism, your siblings are going to be more likely to also have autism. And so therefore, there will absolutely, I think, be female siblings that have not been, that have been missed for diagnosis because they will be more likely to have it being a product of being a sibling, but also because of the kind of bias stuff, they won't, they will be missed. And so, yeah, I think that's an interesting study, though particularly when we think about things like sibling relationships, and we know that it's not a good thing to be missed for diagnosis, what it must feel like to know that your sibling got that early intervention and you didn't. That would be a fascinating study and also a very interesting way to study kind of the same family and how one person might be missed and other doesn't simply by a product of their gender. Good idea, Maria. Are you are you an experimental design? Because that's good. <laughs> I love that. I should do that. I want to do everything. Do females have more sensory symptoms and fewer communication difficulties than males? That's a great that's a great question. So research suggests that females, both with and without autism, develop communication earlier than males. I think all of us that have worked with very young children recognize that. Female children start talking earlier, they communicate more. Um, it's just, it's a pretty stable and that's across the spectrum as well. As for sensory symptoms, I'm not sure that I've seen a gender split in terms of females with autism have more sensory symptoms than males with autism. Um, it's a really interesting point. I'm not sure I'm not sure that I would think that there would be a gender difference in those things, but there might be. I would definitely have to look at the literature for that. Yeah, good question. I have a child who used to bite his hand, but now he started hitting himself and I don't want to know what to do. Um, is stem cell treatment useful? He's starting to scream, I hope you can help. Um, oh good, someone has posted some replies to you. I'm really sorry that you're going through that, Mona. That's really hard and for your child as well. Not sure that we can give a lot of help in that area. I hope that there is professionals that he's able to access, professional care as well and a good support system. Yeah, an occupational therapist would be helpful. Um, yeah. Can girls appear to have strong skills, eye contact, but actually it's masking and thus not diagnosed? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, 
I think it's a really, it's a very difficult thing in a sense to, to think about what is masking and what isn't. And often the women that I've spoken to that have been diagnosed later in life didn't really realize they were masking until they sort of retrospectively looked back on their life now knowing that they had autism and also talked to other people, particularly other autistic women, and found that they just experienced so much more burnout than other people, that they were constantly having to keep track of every little thing that they were doing. Um, the way that it kind of reminded me um, is if you're ever in a really high pressure social environment, so for instance, kind of I don't know, um, having to go to a really formal event and meet a lot of people that you don't know and they're all business contacts and it's a maker to break it, you know, and you watch every single thing you say and you try and come off the absolute best that you can. And it's exhausting and it's stressful. And before you know it, you've sweated through your clothes. And for most of us, those are very rare situations. And for autistic people, and autistic women, those are all kinds of social situations. That's the norm. And so, yes, they do a good job. They're able to perform, but it's exhausting and it's stressful and it and it doesn't feel like they're being authentic the way that all of us feel not authentic in those situations. And so, yes, I think that putting kind of like that metaphor of a duck paddling under the water, um, they're, they're trying so hard to not appear autistic and it can actually be a hindrance in a sense because then they don't get the diagnosis. It's quite unfair in that way. That very long answer to that. I think masking is an, is a really important thing for us to study because we almost encourage it. You know, yeah, develop your social skills, make eye contact, be happy, do all of these good things, but maybe we're doing a lot of harm as well but also it's important to be part of social groups huh. in discussion of burrows were symptoms truly milder or is this an example of clinician bias it's a great quest point what were the criteria of high concern was this determined by symptoms or genetic risk of siblings being diagnosed so i can definitely answer the second part so in the paper they compared the researchers in the project compared their sort of independent, um, their, they, com they looked at the independent notes of clinicians not connected to the study who were working with the children that were being studied. And what they found consistently was that there were notes about the autistic females that said things like, there are symptoms that are of concern. And what they found was that People said, look, these are these are behaviors that we would think of as autistic, but we need to just keep an eye on. People were reticent to say that it definitely was autism. Um, I think that was your question. Now I'm actually realizing your criteria for high concern might have been, um, how are these children of high concern? I see. So high concern, the term high is, is not... Um, indicative of there being high concern or low concern. It's simply a phrase they use to say these are children whose siblings have a diagnosis of autism. So therefore, they are children that we think are likely to be diagnosed, if that makes sense. And then were symptoms truly milder? Or is this an example of clinician bias? This is a great question. Um, they were milder compared to autistic male children in that cohort. That's that's all. That's the only way we can say they were milder. Whether they are actually milder is an incredibly subjective phrase because to have autism, even milder symptoms, and also be a woman might be a lot harder than having more extreme symptoms and being a male. These are one of the many ways where we no longer try to use phrases like high functioning because we are putting a label on the type of experiences that someone has that might not be in step with reality, if that makes sense. These are really good questions. I hope I'm, let me know if you had another one or what is. Would higher intelligence correlate to more advanced masking skills? 
a good question. So we know that higher intelligence, aka, yes, people that one of the ways that we use a cutoff is we say people that have intellectual disability and people that don't. And we would then say it within the autism spectrum. So people with co-occurring ID and people that don't have ID. And those would be people that we used to say would be high functioning. We don't use that term for the reason I said, but um, we do find, yes, that masking is definitely boosted in people that do not have an intellectual disability. Now, if we look at actual IQ scores, that's going to be a different matter. Um, people, for instance, that have average IQ, IQ score of 100 is average, or people that have very high IQ scores, so IQ of 120 plus. Would they have more advanced masking skills? I don't know for sure, and I'm not sure if that's been researched, but I would doubt it, to be honest. I think we look when we look, for instance, at children that have gift, gifted and talented, um, which would be we could kind of assume that would be correlated with quite high IQ. We don't we don't find that social skills are also higher. In fact, we find the inverse: that children that are gifted and talented have high IQ actually have lower social skills compared to children with average to even slightly above average intelligence. So no, I think that masking high IQ autistic children would be poorer. That would be my guess. It's a good, it's a good study. It's a good question. What was the socialization of gender in autism? I don't know. Some word salad I put. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, what was the socialization of gender? Hopefully my presentation covered some of that, but let me know if you meant something more specific. <laughs> I don't know anymore. Uh, did you test the validity and reliability of the self-reported measures? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, so the AQ, which is what I use for a self-report measure of autistic traits, uh, and all of the measures that I used in my autism through the ages are are very um, well studied measures for the different constructs that they test. The AQ um, is, I guess, the one that I've studied the most. Um, its validity is is pretty good. Basically, um, people that score high on the AQ are significantly more likely to receive an autism diagnosis. So it has pretty good specificity in both a clinical and a non-clinical sample. In the UK, for instance, it's the first port of call for pre-screening for autism in adults. There's also a child version, and it has good reliability. So you should, um, people have shown that you can take the AQ at different time points, and you will get around the same score every time. So it doesn't change kind of over time or with age. Um, but I didn't, I didn't test those measures myself. I've sort of just used measures that have been tested for those things in the past. Yeah. Is that female gen, is it that female gender are more socially interactive or their condition are mild or moderate? Is it that fem, is it that the female gen, people in the, people that express the female gender are more socially interactive? or that their condition is mild or moderate. So my opinion on this is the first. It's that we, and that's kind of what I was sort of trying to get at a bit with my big pink and blue sorority Playboy Bunny slide at the beginning, it's a bit overt, but essentially um, I think that females are conditioned from a very early age to be social creatures, more so than males. We're given a lot of tasks in early development. We're given a lot of toys in early development. We're given a lot of praise in early development that are that are particularly social in nature. And a lot of research suggests that. Um, we use different language with female children than male children. We use a lot of kind of social words at a higher frequency. And so it's not surprising that females are kind of encouraged and, and rewarded for being social and therefore they act in more kind of social ways in a sense. So I personally I I quite like that uh 
study that showed that we can find an, an equal split of males and females if we look early enough, we look repeatedly enough. Um, and I wouldn't say that the condition is more mild, even though they found more mild behaviors. I think it's that um, females are sort of acting in ways that are very um, prescribed and that that seems to go against a lot of the ways that we are taught to understand autism. And so we need to reteach ourselves about autism in a way that's compatible with femininity or being female. Where can we find your published studies? Oh, thanks, Lindsay. So um, you can Google them. So these the titles were on the slides, but also please feel free to look me up. You can find me on ResearchGate, where all of my research is available open access. Just Google Gray Atherton. And also all of my research is on my website, which is here, social body cognizant at WordPress. Changing the name, I think, in the next few weeks. About that they should have known these are not very um general public <laughs> friendly words, but there you have it. But please do find please do look up my research and it, there's a lot more explanation on there. That would be amazing. How do I treat the sideways look and frequent screaming? If you have any medications, you can tell me. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, Mona. I wish I could help more about these, these things. Um, I, I don't want to say anything that's outside of my scope of kind of expertise. And it looks like these are questions that would be outside of my areas of expertise. So I, I shouldn't really comment, but um, hopefully there are some ARI talks that are about some of these topics. That would be great. Are you aware of anyone studying quality in life and support for women age? diagnosed in the late 50s? Uh, Deirdre, it's a great question. Um, so I did review some research recently um, that looked at uh, autism. They called it we called it something funny like geriatism um, that was specifically looking at uh, later in life um, kind of autism aging um, issues. There's a wonderful journal that's called Autism in Adulthood that uh, I believe is completely open access and it specifically talks about um, topics that I think would relate to that. So quality of life and support for women diagnosed later in life and yeah. That would, but yeah, there's some, there's some good research that's being done on that also. Um, yeah. Could someone type out the email for me, please? Yeah, of course. Can I type on this? Mm. Yeah, of course I can. Uh, hey, it's, I I can you, can, you can type in the chat if you want to put anything in there. It's, yeah, I see that. Right, yeah, that as well. Yeah, and then you were mentioning um, for some of these topics where people have questions that are outside of your expertise, there are quite a few talks on epilepsy and these other topics um, on the ARI website. So I just posted a link about that. And for definitely, we have expert presenters who've talked on a variety of these different co-occurring medical conditions. So please uh, go uh, search our site and you'll be able to find some of those past talks or future talks that we're doing on that. Amazing. Yeah. How does an evaluator delineate masking from actual skill, i.e. Con eye contact? That's a great question. Um, so autism assessment is a fascinating topic. Um, I, I really, um, I really love it. I love the ADOS, for instance, the autism diagnostic observation schedule, because it, it teaches us sort of, um, for people that are observing and uh, the the assessment, it sort of teaches us what autism really looks like and how we can objectively observe it based on a series of kind of pushes that you do as an evaluator, where for instance, um, probably my favorite task is asking the child to come with me and give the baby doll a bath in the bathtub. And what we're able to do is we're able to see through a series of these the tasks an overall pattern or an overall picture of behavior 
And we should also use not just one assessment, but we should use kind of the intersection of multiple assessments and evaluations and reports. So for instance, we would give an ADOS. We might also give an um, ADI or the autism diagnostic interview to either a parent or the individual. And we might also ask for evaluations from teachers or from parents. And therefore we are able to kind of get lots of different reports from lots of different sources uh, about this person's everyday life experiences. And we also can maybe measure things like adaptive behavior, the violent adaptive behavioral scale. And therefore, maybe someone is really good at masking and they're very good at hiding their, their autistic traits, but they won't do that all the time. Um, they'll be their true self at home. They'll maybe be their true self to their teacher. And we'll be able to see it in the ADOS as well because it's a very long it takes a long time. And so therefore, there's ways where we can kind of get past the mask, which is really important because we don't want people to be missed for diagnosis. We want them to get as early intervention as possible. And so I think also it's it's about um, kind of seeing past some of these masking tricks and trying to think about what else are we seeing here? How can we focus on those behaviors? Are you aware of any research on outcomes for children of autistic mothers? That's a great question, Deirdre. So that was a study that I was uh, doing with one of my students who is an autistic mother. We were doing um, a qualitative research project that was specifically interviewing um, autistic mothers. And she ended up uh, not being able to complete that research. But it's something that I've always wanted to pick up up because I think that it's a fantastic way to also counteract a lot of autistic myths or autism myths. One of the most, um, one of the most harmful myths is about empathy. Uh, I think that there's this myth that um, autistic people don't experience empathy uh, at the same rates and they don't have social motivation. Whereas being a parent, being a mother is the most empathetic role and loving your children and there's no evidence that parents uh, who are autistic are not good caregivers. In fact, we find the opposite, that within families, um, autistic people report even higher attachment uh, than neurotypicals typically do. So those relationships are incredibly important um, to autistic people, and they're very successful within their families' settings. So it's a research area I'm really interested in. And um, and I think it would be a very powerful way of also understanding the autistic female um, phenotype. So that's a very long-winded way of saying I'm not aware of any, but I'd like to do some myself. And I think it's a really important area. Very interested. I'll email you and I'd like a copy of the presentation. Fantastic. Well, I'll be packing that on to Denise. Great information. Thank you so much. Why are clinicians reluctant to diagnose girls with autism despite noticing telltale characteristics? How can we counter out, counter this bias as parents? I think I said, oh, I have already answered that. Great. Oh, because I think I switched. Okay. Uh, is there research on the observed range of gender acquisition? I think that's it. Every female with ASD has had comorbidity and misdiagnosed before getting an accurate diagnosis of ASD, and the others do exist but are secondary to the ASD. Have you seen the same? Um, I have seen these. The same. Absolutely. Um, so, yes, we seem to find this all the time, that by the time you get your autism diagnosis, you've been diagnosed with tons of other things. Um, and by the time you get diagnosed with your autism, you've developed all these other things because you weren't diagnosed with autism. It's a huge chicken and the egg type of problem. And it's exactly the type of reason that we need to understand what is specifically com compatible with being female and being autistic so that this isn't happening. So we're catching it early and so that we're not getting it confused with all these other things. Uh, so yes, I have seen the same. And I, it's a really tough thing to say what's secondary to ASD. 
Um, I think that we tend to think that autism, that's the big one. That's, that's the big one. Everything else is secondary. Everything else we can handle, but the autism one, that's, that's unchanged. Um, and we probably shouldn't be putting those types of categories on things. Um, it's about what's affecting the person the most. Autism might be secondary to the anxiety. Autism might be secondary to the eating disorder. It's what, what's, what's having the biggest effect on that person's daily life. And maybe also saying that both things are important. Well, you're welcome. I think it's important to ask questions to see someone who is truly specialized in diagnosis of autism if in different genders, if that even exists. Yes, absolutely. I think that you're right. Um, it's incredibly important to see someone who is specialized in diagnosing autism in different genders. That is really important. Um, I think that we, and that's one of the things that I'm interested in doing in the future is doing my implicit bias test specifically in um, clinicians. Because it's we need to be aware as clinicians that we might have gender bias. And it's important for people to build up their competencies in diagnosing autism in both genders and being able to skillfully recognize autism, not just in autistic males, but also in autistic females. And people that do have that specialization of working, for instance, with female, with autistic females, that's an incredible um, strength. And there maybe should be more um, awareness and maybe marketing of that as a particular specialty. Have you seen gender dysphoria in relation to autism, specifically in females? Um, yeah, so we know that gender dysphoria is elevated in, aut in autistic people. And we know that autistic people report higher rates of gender dysphoria. So there is some research, I think, that suggests that it's actually even more heightened in biologically, um, in biologically female people, that they're more likely to experience gender dysphoria. Autistic biological females are more likely to experience gender dysphoria than biological, biologically male autistic people, if that makes sense. Uh, and that is a growing area of research. It's a very interesting area of research for me. Um, particularly when we think about the social construct of gender and how um, autistic people might be experiencing uh, less kind of um, less sort of, I don't know, awareness of those categories and therefore may be more likely to be more fluid. And they might also be experiencing more rejection from these kind of very gender um, strict peer groups. We think of like the mean girls kind of table, you can't sit with us. Uh, they might be more likely to reject autistic females and autistic females might therefore not feel as affiliated with those types of, with that type of female presentation. So I definitely think there's an intersection there and I think it's really interesting. Historically, boys have been funneled into activity groups. Schools outside of home, teams, clubs, far more than girls were. That's very true. Now, both boys and girls seem more atomized by video games and cyberspace. How does this affect autism? That's a really good question. Um, so we know that there's higher rates of video game addiction in autistic people compared to non-autistic people. That's been found in several studies. So... Um, as opposed, as it, I'm not sure though about the intersection with that and gender. Um, I think that that probably speaks quite a bit to the idea of kind of restricted and repetitive, restricted interest and repetitive behaviors. Those RRBIs. When you're playing a video game, it can become very repetitive. You sort of learn the system. Um, but uh, as a, and, and we also know that restricted interest becoming really almost obsessed with things, very passionate about things, um, can also be more common and it's, it's a trait of autism. So if we put those things together, video games are kind of a, a breeding ground for that type of RRBI. And that's what is reflected. 
So it's definitely something that I know is of concern to a lot of parents. I think it's of concern to parents of children that are obsessed with video games that don't have autism. And yes, I think it's, I, I don't know how we can turn those tides though. I think that they're a huge part of youth culture now. There's definitely some research. There's someone that's doing research out of, um, where is he? Um, his name is Chris Ferguson. And he kind of takes the argument that video games are a very useful tool for cognitive development. They actually might curb a lot of violent and aggressive behaviors because people are experiencing catharsis. I'm trying to get kids to play video games in groups, to play them in teams, and to make them more social. So I guess the way that I would come at your question is that we need to maybe not fight against things like video games because they're they're here, but maybe we need to think about ways they can be more social and more um, kind of more healthy, and especially probably for autistic youth who are playing them at a really really high rate and maybe engaging in them in ways that aren't healthy. The one study that I'm going to be presenting on also for you is about board games, which are kind of an answer maybe to video games, but are much more social and also something that um, seem to be really popular in autism. Behaviors respond well to ABA. Medication needs psychiatrist and verbal helps too. Do you think the results in the study would be similar if gender identities were part of the equation? For instance, late diagnosis for a biological male who identifies as female. Great question. Yeah. So I think that present, the research that I did, it was difficult to get a sizable, a good, a big enough sample of kind of um, gender diverse individuals but we are starting to be able to collect big enough samples to look at at these specific pockets of the population and i do think that we have different results in my study absolutely i'm not sure what i would predict but i think that it's what i would what i would suggest what i would predict actually is that people who are identified as gender diverse have experienced quality of life hardships. Um, even if their current gender expression is in line with who they really are, which is a good thing, which is very positive, they probably will have experienced some difficulties leading up to that journey. Some things that have negatively impacted quality of life and mental health. And so I would, I would expect that that would be even more difficult, but um, I'm not sure. And I think it would be really interesting to study um, oh, I see. And then also late diagnosis for a biological male who later, I'm guessing later, would identify as female. I think that they would be identifying as female later in life and that they probably would have gotten their diagnosis earlier because they're a biological male. So in that case, I do think that we would probably see similarity. Good question, Erica. Oh, thank you. How do you see gender dysphoria in relation to autism, especially for females? How do you see gender dysphoria for females? So it's not an area that I have studied myself. It's an area I'm familiar with through other research. But even then, I'm not as well-versed in that as I would like to. So as I would like to be, I think it's really interesting and I would like to be involved in that research, but I probably can't answer something that broadly yet. But there is some pretty good research on that. And um, I would, for anyone that's interested in just finding out some of the stuff, what's been published on it, if you're not familiar with Google Scholar, scholar.google.com. You can type in keywords like gender dysphoria, autism, female, and you'll come up with um, most of them are free to access publications where you can read about what people have published on these topics. I definitely encourage you to look there. Also concerns about unidentified girls with autism, relationship issues, both romantic and family, as well as lack of advocating or receiving comprehensive medical care, especially early detection of breast cancer. Putting the speaker in the email to go and have a job. Uh, thank you so much. 
Yeah, these are very, very important issues. I haven't thought about the detection of breast cancer. But absolutely. I think that that would, I, I see how kind of health, physical health concerns can be manifested and sort of the mental health concerns that develop from a lack of timely diagnosis and possible sort of not, not being in touch with your body because you aren't able to understand yourself. Possibly. I don't know. It's a really interesting point. It's very important. Well, gender bias is nurturing. Thank you so much for the info. You're welcome, Donna. I agree with your comment. I'm envy myself. I'm very deeply involved parent in every aspect of life. My kids. It's exhausting sometimes because I feel their feelings. But what did I got to do? Oh, that's lovely. You're welcome. The research regarding chronic stress and ASD in regards to comorbidities. Not sure about that. Of course, there. My answer is yes. Autism was one of the most wonderful um, areas of research because even though we think it's only at the moment it's estimated 1% to 3% of the population, there's so much great research on it. So I would say absolutely there's research on chronic stress and ASD in regard to comorbidities. And kind of just the chronic stress of having to, you know, maybe experience autism and comorbidities or perceiving these comorbidities because of a missed diagnosis or misdiagnosis. That's very stressful. And yes, I think it takes a toll on individuals. I would definitely suggest um, if there is a webinar on this on ARI, but maybe also Google Scholar specifically if it's something you're interested in or you've experienced. There's been research that male um, Physicians tend to have worse outcomes with female patients, but female physicians have no significant difference. Do you know any research done on professionals who diagnose autism? Fantastic question, Lindsay. You've had so many good questions tonight. Um, I don't know of that research. I think, though, that makes a lot of sense. There's a wonderful organization here in the UK called SWAN, which is Scottish Women's Autistic Network. And they are going to take some of this um, attitude that it takes women to know women. And it's very helpful if there's congruence possibly between gender sort of peer groups, but probably also professionals. And they use that group also as a network for professionals. I think that, yeah, I, um, that probably could play a role. Absolutely. Because we understand... I. I was reading the quote about masking the adolescent girls talking about how they copy what other people do. I was thinking that that's what women do all the time. We go into a group of lots of other women, particularly, and try and copy what they're doing so that we fit in and we make them feel comfortable with us. We don't stick out and we ingratiate ourselves. In a sense, it's almost how we are polite. We try and just do what other people are doing. And it's a very, and, and so therefore I think we could relate quite a bit when other women who are autistic talk about masking simply as a product of being, I'm also a woman that masks more than average uh, because I'm a woman. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. You think autism is related to schizophrenia? I don't know about that one either, Mona. You're asking really great questions, but they're, they are a bit outside of my, unfortunately, outside of my area of expertise. Um, so I'm not sure. And I probably shouldn't say because I don't know for certain, but I don't think so. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, you hung in there and answered all the questions. Thank you for doing that, Dr. Atherton. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. And so for every pleasure. Yeah, for everyone who's still here, the knowledge quiz is up and you can go and take that. The link is in the chat. We also sent it with your reminder email earlier today. So if you'd like to take the quiz and get clock hours um, with your organization, you'll need to check with your organization about whether or not they accept certificates of participation or not. For everybody who's still here, uh, we do have more webinars on our website. So be sure to check out autismwebinars.org and check out our upcoming presentations. And again, we will see you again in the future, Dr. Atherton, and we're so glad that you're here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. All right, we'll see everybody else next time. Take care.